Hello and welcome to Iron Africa, France 24's show focused on the continent. I'm Yella Lee and these are your top stories tonight. Libya's polls are postponed. The parliament says it's impossible to organize the event on Friday, leaving the internationally backed peace process up in the air. A Tunisian court sentences an ex-president to four years in prison. Monsef Marzouki is a vocal critic of the current leader, describing Kaya Syed as a dictator. And Nigeria destroys more than one million doses of expired COVID vaccines. As rich countries donate jabs with short shelf life, poorer nations continue their fight against vaccine hesitancy. We start the show in Libya, where plans for a December 24th election have fallen through. The country's electoral commission has proposed to delay the presidential poll by one month. The internationally backed project has been surrounded in controversy with divisive candidates, difficulties defining eligibility rules, as well as fears of insecurity. For more on this, uh, I have the uh, pleasure to welcome William Lawrence to the show. He's a professor in international relations and a MENA specialist at the American University. Uh, professor, there are uh, legal obstacles, uh, divisive candidates. Could you pinpoint the main obstacles you think are, are, are existing to the vote uh, right now? The main obstacle is that we just had a war with a ceasefire and all those who fought the war still don't agree on anything. And what that does is it creates a situation whereby the UN has to oppose things on Libyans uh, that the polit politicians can't agree on, on behalf of the Libyan people who enthusiastically, according to the registration and polling, really want to vote and turn the page, which is the only reason the UN is imposing these solutions. We then had the UN envoy uh, in charge of the process unexpectedly resign last month. Uh, and they didn't have time to pick a new one, so they brought in the ex-acting envoy as an advisor to the U.S. Secretary General, Stephanie Williams, and she's been doing shuttle diplomacy in Libya uh, to try to get the factions to agree on the technical uh, uh, issues around the elections. And what are those? Uh, who can run and who can be barred from running? Uh, and then the modalities of the election, the dates and the security for the elections and things like that. There are also a lot of spoilers out there who would just as like see the whole thing fall apart and to take over the country again. Uh, and there are militias moving around, so there's a lot of fears that that could become a problem. But it's really a set of technical issues that need to fall into place uh, with the UN imposing its will on the parties to some degree. Well, well Professor, there are such, so many major issues as, as you've just described there. Why did the international community uh, push for? for what critics have described very early on as a near impossible deadline? Uh, because they were never going to meet the deadline and they're never going to meet any deadline. That was my point in the first thing I said. So when the, it was originally announced, I believe last June or early July, that it was going to be December 24th, my third first thought was they'll never be ready by the 24th. It'll be a few weeks after that. Um, those that want longer postponements now are listing all the issues that have been in place since July needing to be resolved by, you know, pick a date, three months out, six months out, 12 months out. But I guarantee you, whatever the delay, they won't resolve those issues, which is why I'm saying the UN has to impose its will. So among those questions, why can Saif al-Islam Qaddafi, who actively fought against the revolution, win the election that are its fruits and has war crimes, he's wanted for war crimes by the UN? Why can General Haftar, whose lieutenants are wanted for war crimes uh, and who has several lawsuits for war crimes against him, why is he running? These are number um, two and number three in the polling in Libya right now. Uh, so so that those are among the legal issues. And whether they're barred or not barred, what the Libyan people really want is to vote and not vote for those two individuals. Uh, that's the larger number. This is the group sort of around Tripoli and in the West who who fought hard against Saif al-Sam Qaddafi and against Haftar. Uh, his support is elsewhere in the country. Uh, but these 3 million, you know, this population of 3 million, these 1.5 million voters in the West, uh, I don't really care if it's the courts that bar these anti-democratic candidates from running or if it's the voting that, that keeps them out of power. They just want to vote. And you mentioned some of the uh, security issues there. Could you remind our viewers what the security situation is uh, like right now in Libya? So the way you think about Libya is um, it's a country run by militias. There really is no regular army or the police. And, and about 80% of the militias are sort of doing the right thing. 
And then there are other kinds of bad militias, let's say. There are jihadist militias, there are criminal militias, there are yeah, um, uh, anti-revolution militias, uh, and those are the militia spoilers. And then you've got about 30 conflict zones around Libya. So you can have flare-ups over here or flare-ups over there, or you can have battling among militias over how to protect a polling place. But the thing to keep in mind is not militias bad, everybody else good, but, but, but you can't have a revolution without the militias. You can't even have a ceasefire or elections now without militias. Um, but it's the sort of 80% of militias that are on the right side of things that are going to have to control the situation and keep the other militias back. All right, I'm afraid that's all we have time for. Thank you so much, William uh, Lawrence, uh, for joining us on the show. A uh, Tunisian court has sentenced former President Monsef Marzouki to four years in prison. The doctor turned uh, politician lives in Paris and was not present at the trial. The state uh, news agency there reported that he was tar charged for crimes of assaulting the uh, external security of the state. Marzouki is a vocal critic of current leader Kaya Syed, describing his uh, tightening grip on power as a coup d'etat. For more on this, uh, here's our correspondent Fadil Ali Reza. What we're getting is uh, from the state news agency, and they've said they've gotten actually a verdict uh, from the uh, Tunis court um, that had uh, basically issued a verdict about um, uh, the former president in absentia to uh, four years in prison for uh, assaulting um, uh, the external security of the state, uh, harming diplomatic relations. Um, it's unclear what law this refers to, but what we do know is that uh, on October 15th, state prosecutors had opened an investigation to the former president um, related to his comments actually on October 12th in a, in a France 24 um, uh, Arabic uh, program where he had said that he had been he'd been proud to be one of the people who had been, played a role in um, delaying the Francophonie summit that was uh, set to take place in Tunis but had been uh, postponed um, and, and, and one of those who had um, uh, succeeded in um, uh, disrupting uh, diplomatic relations between France and Tunisia. So this may be related to that but it's unclear. We haven't gotten confirmation of that yet. What we do know is that we do know that the uh, former President Marzouki has also been a very strong critic of uh, current President Kai Saeed, particularly since July 25th when the President um, uh, dismissed Parliament in what uh, many, including critics such as Marzouki, have called a coup. Next uh, to uh, Nigeria, where authorities have destroyed more than a million doses of expired COVID vaccines. The idea is to boost public confidence in AstraZeneca jabs and show citizens that old ones have indeed been dumped. Rich countries have been donating vaccines with short shelf life, illustrating vaccine inequality in action, as well as fueling fears about safety of jabs. Lauren Bersticker has the story. Hundreds of boxes, filled to the brink with expired AstraZeneca vaccines, heading straight to the dumpster. Over a million doses were buried in this landfill near Abuja, under the watchful gaze of journalists and health officials. Just a week after Nigeria's health minister said the country would stop accepting donations of vaccines with a short shelf life, this public show of destruction was a way to put words into action and send a message to Western nations that their leftover jabs were no longer wanted. When these vaccines were offered to us, we knew that they had a short shelf life. But we were living in an environment where the supply of COVID-19 vaccines were very sparse. They were not available due to vaccine nationalism. We had developed countries that procured these vaccines and hoarded them in their stores. At the point that they were about to expire, they were offered for donation. With only 3% of its population fully inoculated, Nigeria's vaccination campaign is lagging behind. Health experts say the country needs to triple its current vaccination rates in order to meet its target of 50% by late 2022. And despite a recent surge in vaccine supply, several obstacles remain, including logistical and transportation issues, as well as lingering mistrust of the vaccine by parts of the population. 
In Kenya, proof of vaccination will be required to use public places such as parks, hotels, government offices and uh, public transportation. The health ministry's plans contradicting an earlier court order against these very measures. Human Rights Watch has uh, criticised the government's plans, saying that they're discriminatory. There's been a surge in COVID-19 cases in the country. The latest daily count standing at over 3,300 positives. And finally, uh, let's turn our attention to the economic situation in the Ivory Coast. With the end-of-year festivities approaching, many households are finding it difficult to meet their basic food needs. Recently, the government has taken measures to curb inflation. Hanan Verjani and Damian Kofi went to see if they're making a difference. It's noon in Yopugon, where streets are swarming ahead of Christmas Day. Flora has come to her usual marketplace to buy food. In spite of her hard work as a self-employed masseuse, she is finding it increasingly difficult to provide for her family. I'll make the aubergine sauce. It's cheaper for me. It should be enough for me and my family. That will be for one meal for tonight's supper. The shopkeepers, too, are affected by the general increase in prices. This vendor has not been able to sell a piece of meat since she came in this morning. When we ask why the prices have gone up, they tell us it's the taxes. Buying food on a daily basis or sacrificing a meal, such is the grim reality that more and more Ivorians are faced with. I'll come tomorrow and shop again. I'm a widow and I have two children. How am I supposed to manage? According to the National Institute of Statistics, from 2020 to 2021, some products such as meat or fish have seen a surge of over 10%. In recent months, the government has vowed to control the prices of basic necessities. However, authorities insist that inflation is primarily due to trader speculation. In the face of this growing pressure on households, NGOs have intensified donation collection as the holidays near. In this working-class neighborhood, some hundred families will go home with essential food kits. Not swear. Our wish is that families can spend the holidays in good conditions. There should be access to food for all. Those who were selected today should be able to feed themselves for at least a few days, say the organizers. A well-deserved break before Christmas. That's it for Iron Africa. More international news coming up next.